and thanks to the SSA board for this invitation. For this 30 minute presentation, I had to make some hard choices. So I will focus on the global scale, primarily on the lower mantle, on the deep Earth's interior. So please don't be disappointed if I don't mention the Earth's crust or your favorite regional discovery. My presentation will not be chronological, but rather focused on different regions of the Earth. So I will jump around in time. Around 1980, we had a pretty good idea from seismology of the 1D structure of the Earth with its major internal discontinuities. By confronting with mineral physics experiments at high P and T, we also knew the average composition of each shell. In particular, we knew that the two discontinuities at 400 and 600 kilometers depth corresponded to phase changes in the olivine system. We knew that radial anisotropy was necessary to explain the dispersion of love and Rayleigh waves simultaneously. And we also knew that the last 300 kilometers of the mantle, the D double prime layer was special because of the change in gradient in the velocity structure detected in body wave travel time studies. Now, this is a static view of the Earth. And of course, the major advance in the last 40 years has been about the 3D structure, which provides constraints on the dynamics. But let's first see how this 1D structure has changed since. Two discontinuities have been added that correspond to mineral phase changes at 520 kilometers depth and at the top of D double prime. There is also something going on at around 1000 kilometers depth, which I will discuss later. So the first discontinuity is the 520 kilometer one. It was first documented in 1990 using global stacks of seismograms highlighting SS precursors. Concerns were raised that this could be an artifact from side lobes related to the 400 and 660 kilometer discontinuities nearby. But later, this horizon was uh, also detected at shorter periods within uh, long range uh, seismic profiles. And it was also proposed that it was associated with the Waslerite to Ringwoodite phase transition in the olivine system. Recent studies of the topography of the 520 kilometer discontinuity show that it is consistent with this Waslerite to Ringwoodite Clapeyron slope, provided one accounts for the additional presence of some compositional variations. The second discontinuity in the deep mantle, which was actually discovered earlier, is the so-called this double prime discontinuity, which corresponds to a two to three percent increase in shear velocity, uh, somewhat smaller in compressional velocity, with a depth that is laterally varying around two to three hundred kilometers above the core mantle boundary. It's observed over long ranges of thousands of kilometers and primarily robust under continental regions, but not only. Some questions were again raised that it could be due to scattering in strongly heterogeneous D double prime structure. However, the discovery in 2004 of the post perovskite transition in MGSIO3 perovskite, now called the Bridgmanite, in, at pressures and temperatures conditions corresponding to the core mantle boundary region, was immediately associated with the D double prime discontinuity, providing more support for its existence. While some uncertainties remain about the Clapeyron slope of this phase transition in the real Earth, it now seems rather likely that the post perovskite exists in D double prime, at least in the colder regions of, the, uh, of this uh, layer. I'd like to now make a quick excursion to the inner core before focusing again on the mantle to mention the important discovery that the solid inner core is anisotropic. This was first shown in two back-to-back -back papers from Harvard University, which indicated that two different types of observation could be explained by a simple model of cylindrical anisotropy in the inner core with the axis of symmetry parallel to the Earth's rotation axis. First, the fact that the PKP phase that is sensitive to the inner core travels faster on polar paths than on equatorial paths. And second, the fact that uh, inner core sensitive modes are anomalously split, as can be seen from the comparison of these two 
splitting functions from a core mode, 6S3. Splitting functions are like phase velocity maps for modes, compared to, comparing this inner core mode to a typical mantle mode. Models of inner core and isotropy have become more complicated since then, with evidence for hemispherical structure, with one hemisphere more anisotropic than the other, initially reported from body wave studies, but later also from normal mode studies. At present, it appears that only a wedge rather than an entire hemisphere might be strongly anisotropic, at shallow depths in the inner core at least. This wedge contains a highly anomalous path from the South Sandwich Islands to Alaska, whose origin is still a matter of debate. I should say a word about the differential rotation of the inner core with respect to the mantle, which was first proposed by Song and Richards in 1996, based on 25 years of PKP data on the same path between the South Sandwich Islands and Alaska, assuming a slightly tilted axis of symmetry of the anisotropy with respect to the Earth's rotation axis. Since then, many studies based on different methods and different types of waves have attempted to verify this result, which is important for geodynamicists studying the core dynamo and reversals of the geomagnetic field. However, over the years, the estimated rotation rate has been questioned and is now settled at much smaller values, if at all, although there are still some disagreements about it. Now let's go back to the mantle. An important advance has been the introduction of the technique of travel time tomography to seismology, both in the regional case with the famous ACH method and in the global case proposed in the same year, in 1977. I will not discuss the regional case further and focus on the global scale. The first global models were already able to resolve the first order long wavelength structure of the Earth. For the upper mantle, they were built using surface waves, here actually already using surface waveforms. This was an important result because it confirmed that tomography worked and at the same time validated what is expected from plate tectonics theory with slower than average ridges, that is warmer than average, cold continental routes and the cooling of the Pacific plate away from the East Pacific rise as manifested by increasingly faster seismic velocities. The lower mantle models, on the other hand, were derived from teleseismic body wave travel times, as first shown in the 1977 Javonsky et al. paper, the structure appeared to be quite different than in the upper mantle with two equatorially placed low velocity zones uh, separated by a ring of fast velocities. The observation that this seismic structure was anti-correlated with that of the geoid led to the realization that this reflected mantle dynamics and could be explained by global circulation in a viscous earth, including the deflection of major discontinuities such as the core mantle boundary and of course the surface due to flow. And also the possibility of compositional heterogeneity in the deep mantle, which we are discussing a lot today, was first proposed in the 1977 paper. The relation of the fast velocity ring to subduction was also realized, and this ring of fast velocity was coined the graveyard of slabs. Today, higher resolution travel time tomography is used in conjunction with paleomagnetic and geological data to produce detailed tectonic reconstruction going back to about 250 million years, with the added advantage that if one accepts these interpretations, seismology provides constraints on the paleo longitude of the continental masses. Combining travel time data of first arriving shear waves and fundamental mode surface waves with surface wave overtones, as well as other measurable body waves sensitive to shear, subsequently led to good resolution in shear velocity, at least at the long wavelengths, across the whole mantle. Several different groups developed such whole mantle long wavelength models with good agreement on the main features as we go down from the uppermost mantle to the core mantle boundary. Also highlighting that the spectrum of heterogeneity is dominated by long wavelengths, so-called degree two, both 
near the surface and at the core mantle boundary, as would be expected in a convection system with two boundary layers. In the transition zone and upper lower mantle, fast velocity regions in the Western Pacific and in South America have long been associated with slabs, but it wasn't clear why they were visible at these long wavelengths in the transition zone, but not so clearly in the upper 400 kilometers of the mantle. This puzzle was resolved or when comparing with P and S travel time based models, which have higher resolution in subduction zones and the realization that slabs formed at 660 kilometers depths and also around a thousand kilometers depths, which was even more surprising. Of course, a most intriguing feature is the strikingly different structure at the base of the mantle with its large low shear velocity provinces surrounded by a ring of fast velocities coined LLSVPs for lack of a better name, at least so far. This structure is robust across all models. If one extracts the longest wavelength structure of the LLSVPs, the so-called degree two structure here in 3D rendering, the antipodal equatorial position of this component of the LLSVPs is striking, as is the fact that the ring of fast velocity contains the location of the present day polar rotation of the Earth, as well as the paleopole locations going back 250 million years, which suggests a stable configuration for the, from the point of view of the moments of inertia of the Earth. This structure is also reminiscent from what one would expect from the simplest form of convection in a sphere with two antipodal upwellings and one ring of downwelling. Another piece of evidence for the stability through geologic times, at least recent geologic times, is the correlation of the position of the large igneous provinces with the borders of the African LLSVPs when they are positioned at the time of eruption. Stability of LLSVPs suggest that they may be heavier than their surroundings and therefore of distinct composition. So let's see what else we have learned about the LLSVPs. They have sharp edges as seen by offset in S and S diffracted arrivals over small different ranges here on the Atlantic side of the African LLSVP and also similar offsets combined with waveform complexity when sampling the LLSVP, the edge of the LLSVP over a range of azimuth here on the southern Indian Ocean side of the African LLSVP again. Such sharp rapid changes are difficult to explain by thermal anomalies alone. There is also evidence for anti-correlation of shear and bulk sound velocity documented first from PNS body wave tomography which is hard to explain by thermal variations alone. And it's also seen in the analysis of normal mode spectra and confirmed in more recent studies based on analysis of much larger combination of seismic phases. This particular study by Ishi and Trump suggested in addition that density is also anti-correlated with shear velocity near the core mantle boundary, a controversial result at the time which remains controversial today. An important discovery was that of ultra low velocity zones, patches of strongly reduced compressional and also shear velocity, generally of several hundreds of kilometers in lateral extent and tens of kilometers in vertical extent above the core mantle boundary. It was first observed using the phase SPDKS, which diffracts along the core mantle boundary at the P wave, but since then, OULVZs have been found in many regions of the world, mainly within and on the borders of the LLSVPs, while they are mostly absent, as shown in the blue patches here, in, uh, around, in the ring of fast velocities surrounding the LLSVPs. Another important discovery is the detection of anisotropy in D-double prime, which started with an observation of Mitchell and Hamburger in 1973, of offsets in the arrival times of SCS waves on the radial and transverse components of motion. These authors interpreted this in terms of variable gradients in velocity at the base of the mantle. 
Later, shear wave splitting of the S diffracted wave with ellipt characteristic elliptical motion was shown by Lev Vinnik on a path where no contribution from upper mantle anisotropy should be present in the SKS and SKS, SKKS waveforms. And he suggested this could be due to anisotropy. Since then, many studies have confirmed the presence of anisotropy in D double prime, and a large scale coherent picture has emerged. Here in the background, you can see the LLSVPs highlighted in red from a voting map that compares agreement across five different tomographic models that this is a region of lower than average velocity at long wavelengths. Regions where VSH is faster than VSV, the white lines and ellipses, fall in regions of higher than average isotropic velocity. Conversely, there is little or no anisotropy within the LLSVPs, the black ellipses, and if there is, VSV is faster than VSH. And there is also strongly varying anisotropy at the borders of the LLSVPs, here marked by the green symbols. This correlation is consistent with what would be expected from the presence of strongly anisotropic post-perovskite in colder than average regions. Voting maps are one way to extract robust structure in 3D models. Another way is to perform cluster analysis as done here on five different whole mantle shear velocity models, highlighting the LLSVPs and the ring of fast velocities around them. The depth cross sections, on the other hand, indicate that these LLSVPs perhaps extend high up into the lower mantle as compact structures and sometimes uh, up to a thousand kilometers above the core mantle boundary. But note that these are not images of actual structure. They're not actual tomographic images. They only tell us about the agreement of the five tomographic models after they have been filtered to long wavelengths, here up to maximum spherical harmonics degree of 18. This does not preclude the possibility of smaller scale heterogeneity within the LLSVPs and the possibility that there might be holes in these uniformly looking structures that are not resolved at these wavelengths. And indeed, there is still currently a debate as to whether the LLSVPs are dense piles made up of remnants of primordial material or of subducted crust, or whether they simply represent a bundle of plumes which cannot be well resolved with long wavelength seismic tomography. This brings me to the topic of mantle plumes and whether mid-plate hotspot volcanism is due to the presence of plumes of hot material anchored somewhere in the deep mantle, a concept that was introduced by Tuzo Wilson and Jason Morkan at the time of the plate tectonics revolution in the 1960s. The problem is that hotspot volcanism occurs primarily on isolated islands, offering insufficient aperture for deep structure resolution, necessitating the challenging deployment of ocean bottom stations such as in this experiment around Hawaii. The resulting tomographic images indicated that Hawaii may be underlain by a low velocity conduit to great depths. However, the aperture of the array was still limited with crossing rays only in the upper mantle, leading to the possibility that the image could contain artifacts due to smearing along the ray path. The introduction of finite frequency kernels in teleseismic travel time tomography allowed in principle better resolution of low velocity bodies, accounting for wavefront healing in particular, and resulted in pictures of contorted, relatively broad, possibly continuous low velocity plume-like conduits beneath many of the oceanic islands. But the same criticism of insufficient ray crossings and ray smearing left the question still open. In order to improve illumination, it is important to take advantage of all the different reflected and converted waves inside the Earth that appear on earthquake records, which is made possible by full waveform inversion. In earthquake seismology, full waveform tomography goes back to the Woodhouse and Jivonsky 1984 paper that I presented earlier for surface waves. And in my group, we practiced it since the early 1990s, but it has only made a real difference recently with the introduction of the spectral element method 
to global seismology, allowing us to compare entire seismic records with accurate 3D synthetics in the global Earth without any restrictions on the wavelengths of strength of heterogeneity. We now have much clearer evidence for the presence of broad columns of low shear velocity material extending vertically from the core mantle boundary to the upper mantle in the vicinity of major hotspots, as shown here beneath the Pacific. These broad plumes are indeed wider than would be expected for purely thermal plumes and are therefore likely thermochemical plumes. Besides the resolved fat plumes, there may be others, thinner ones, such as beneath Yellowstone, as shown in a recent, more regionally focused study by Nelson and Grant. We also see those broad plumes in the Atlantic Hemisphere. One striking feature everywhere is the strong reduction of velocity at their base, and also the fact that they, in many cases, they appear to be deflected horizontally at about a thousand kilometers depth, as seen here beneath Canary, Cape Verde, and also Iceland, and as also visible from more focused regional four waveform tomographic studies here again in Iceland. Notice here the broken character of the African LLSVP in the lower left side plot, uh, which shows a cross section, north south cross section uh, beneath Africa. This doesn't seem to be an artifact. Here again, I'm showing two nearby north-south cross-sections beneath Africa, in which I have indicated in broken line a possible not fully resolved set of three plumes. And at the bottom are the results of synthetic resolution tests showing that a compact, tall LLSVP would not be broken up by the inversion process, whereas the set of individual plumes would be at least partially resolved. There is also evidence from forward modeling of travel times of teleseismic S waves, as in this paper uh, by uh, Kessler et al, that there are holes in the African LLSVPs. Here, this big gap found in this study. The presence of these large fat plumes has independently been confirmed recently by a spectral element method-based full waveform study from Princeton University, as shown here for two example cross-sections. Recently, very large ultra-low velocity zones have been found with lateral extents of about a thousand kilometers in the roots of several major plumes, like here under Hawaii, using in particular shear waves diffracting along the core mantle boundary, forward modeling of shear waves diffracted along the core mantle boundary. The nature of the ultra-low velocity zones is still debated. They could be due to partial melt with iron enrichment in the melt or possibly solid regions of enhanced iron concentration. Other mega ULVZs have also been found under Samoa, Iceland, Marquesas, and recently under Galapagos. And I wouldn't be surprised if such large ultra-low velocity zones, mega ultra-low velocity zone, turn up beneath other such fat plumes, or even that many of the ULVCs observed so far uh, would, could be associated with the roots of one or another kind of mantle plume. Before I finish, I'd like to spend a little more time on the fascinating observation of deflected slabs and plumes around a thousand kilometer depths, or certainly between 660 and a thousand kilometer depths, which indicates the presence of a possible rheological boundary at that depth, and not necessarily at the 660 kilometer discontinuity, which we know is a mineralogical phase change. There is no agreed upon mineral phase transition at this depth yet. However, a discontinuity around this depth has been picked up, possibly with large topography in several studies, starting from this study by Kawakatsu and New in 1994, where they detected reflections and conversions of various body wave phases around 900 to 1000 kilometers depth. The presence of an important geodynamic boundary 
in the mid-mantle was advocated by Wen and Anderson in a series of papers in the mid-1990s. And in fact, the decorrelation of tomographic models, which Wen and Anderson mention here around a thousand kilometers depth, is actually clearly seen in depth correlation plots for both P and S global models. Here, what this plot shows is how a, um, the structure at a particular depth is correlated with all the different other depths uh, in the model. At the top is the gap P4 model of Fukao and Obayashi uh, P model, and here is one of our models uh, from my group, SMMDU, which is an S model. You can see a strong correlation at long wavelengths of the structure in the last 2,000 kilometers of the mantle from 1,000 kilometers depth to the core mantle boundary in both models. And then a decorrelation or a lack of correlation of this deep mantle structure with the structure in the extended transition zone from 400 to 1,000 kilometers depth. And it's interesting to note that this change in pattern at longest wavelengths is actually clearly visible in tomographic models. I want to say all tomographic shear wave velocity tomographic models. Here you can see a comparison of three recent shear wave tomographic models showing the average degree two pattern in three regions of the mantle, which were, which were baptized the heterosphere, the top um, two, 300 kilometers of the mantle, the downwelling planet from the transition zone to a, uh, from the top of the transition zone to a thousand kilometers depth, and then the upwelling planet uh, from a thousand to uh, kilometers to the um, core mantle boundary, uh, names that were given um, to these regions by Adam Jelinski shortly before he passed away. This well-resolved change in pattern has been there in tomographic models for at least 15 to 20 years, but somehow its significance had not been noticed for many years. To summarize, I have listed here the topics that I have discussed so far. In black, I highlighted those features which are now well established. In red, observations and interpretations that may still be open for some debate. And I've added a cartoon from one of our recent papers highlighting topics to be further pursued in the future and summarizing the situation as I see it today, which is of course open for discussion. Fat thermochemical plumes are rising from within the LLSVPs at the core mantle boundary with large ULVZs at their roots and slabs are slowly falling to the bottom of the mantle. The plumes and slabs are not much deflected in the lower mantle, which moves very slowly, very sluggish, in contrast to the top 1,000 kilometers of the mantle, where there is likely a secondary scale convection system that is more vigorous and results in the deflections of both plumes and slabs. I have not had time to discuss the many important observations that have been made in the upper mantle in the last 40 years, and which include, for example, widespread laterally varying radial and azimuthal anisotropy, or the presence of mid lithospheric discontinuities, both in cratons, in stable continental areas, and in ocean basins. But I'm happy to take questions about it too. I'm also sorry I did not have time to discuss the inner core further, even though there are many more features than just the simple um, cylindrical anisotropy that I talked about very briefly. All these advances would of course not have been possible without advances in theory and in sophisticated data analysis techniques, as well as um, the increase of in computational power, which has been tremendous in the last 40 years. I've touched upon various aspects of tomography, but not all. I've mentioned shear wave splitting, which has been fundamental in studies of anisotropy, both in the upper mantle and in the D double prime. And I did not talk at all about receiver functions, which have been key in the study of the lithosphere asthenosphere system. Finally, all this has relied on the development in the late 1970s of high quality broadband and very broadband instrumentation and continues to rely on the sustained efforts in many countries in the deployment of global and regional broadband networks from which we have superb digital data collected in freely accessible online archives, such as that of IRIS in the US 
or fears in Europe and many others. We must continue to promote and support free access to seismic and other geophysical data, an effort which requires a lot of resources, an open mind of the community, and it needs to be sustained. To improve resolution of the deep structure, we also must improve our coverage of the ocean floor, an effort which started in the 1980s with the idea of the International Ocean Network, but lost momentum due to formidable logistical and financial challenges. However, it has recently been picked up again in a slightly different form by such initiatives as the Pacific Array, which um, is starting to deploy uh, long-term, that is um, one or two year deployments of uh, large aperture broadband arrays in the oceans. In my view, those arrays, or this is my dream, this array, that these arrays should be even larger aperture so that we can really um, improve the resolution. However, uh, for now, this is still a dream. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention. You're live. Thank you very much, Barbara, for a fantastic talk summarizing all the advances, advances we made over the last 40 years or so. Um, we're now going to move into the question and answer session. And uh, I'm joined uh, for this by Jerome Ritzmer from the University of Michigan, who is the editor at large of our new journal, The Seismic Record. Uh, Jerome will be asking questions and I'll be helping him to field those questions and, and pass them on to Barbara. So if you'd like to ask a question, please enter it into the chat and we'll keep an eye on that and ask them uh, as they come up and as time permits. So I'll turn over to you, Jerome, if you'd like to start with the questions. Yes, thanks, uh, John, and welcome everybody to the session and thanks for coming. Um, so before I, I turn to a question that's been uh, asked in the chat, uh, I want to ask Barbara also to say a few words about her, about the work on, on anisotropy and, and attenuation uh, in the upper mantle. Um, as all of, know, all of us know, she has made very important contributions there as well. And so uh, I'd like to hear her, her take on that research and also on the prospects of, of new developments. Thank you, Jeroen, and thank you everybody for uh, um, listening to my presentation. Uh, I did not talk about the upper mantle because I was short on time, so I welcome uh, Jeroen's question. Uh, of course, there have been uh, many uh, different important discoveries on the upper mantle, and uh, Jeroen uh, put his finger on the two most important ones, one uh, being the um, presence of uh, anisotropy, uh, both radial and azimuthal anisotropy in the upper mantle, uh, and the other one, the studies of the three-dimensional structure of attenuation. So in terms of anisotropy, uh, at the global scale, the last 40 years, we have learned about uh, the fact that um, there is a very strong um, azimuthal anisotropy in the upper mantle uh, globally, and that in the, at least in the ocean basins, it, um, um, uh, it varies with depth, well, it varies with depth everywhere, but it varies with depth in the ocean basins, and um, sufficiently deep uh, below the, the lithosphere, it, uh, give, it, is, uh, it basically gives us an idea of the, or it helps us constrain the dynamics of the upper mantle in the sense that it provides the directions of fast axis of anisotropy um, relate to the um, directions of flow. So these are very important uh, results. Uh, I actually have not made myself any uh, global azimuthal anisotropy models, but uh, many um, many seismologists, uh, global seismologists have, and these have been related to um, uh, models of, glo of global uh, dynamics and uh, um, you know, coupling, how the plates couple with the underlying circulation. So that's at the global scale. At the regional scale, uh, there is um, evidence for layering in the anisotropy which where you can distinguish what is going on in the lithosphere and in the asthenosphere. And that is true, not only in the oceans, but in the continents and, uh, and has been also uh, an, a sort of the, the topic of, of uh, many studies uh, in, in the last uh, decades. Uh, in terms of attenuation, and I can elaborate on this if, if needed, 
more. In particular, there have been uh, studies of, uh, of an isotopy in the uh, oceans, which, uh, which indicates that radial anisotropy and azimuthal anisotropy are not seeing the same thing in the ocean basins, but delineate perhaps some layering that, uh, that can distinguish the thermal and the compositional uh, structure uh, in, in, uh, in these ocean basins. Um, as, and then also work on um, uh, from SKS splitting studies uh, around subduction zones, uh, uh, kind of identifying the possible flow uh, patterns uh, of, uh, of the man of uh, the asthenosphere around subduction zone. As far as Q is concerned, well, um, 3D tomography of Q has lagged behind elastic tomography considerably because it is much harder to extract the um, anelastic signal from, um, from waveforms. The anelastic signal uh, comes about in the measurement of amplitudes of seismic waves, which themselves depend not only on the intrinsic attenuation, but also on the uh, elastic uh, scattering and focusing effects. And separating these two effects, as long as we don't have the excellent knowledge of, of a small scale elastic structure is, is, is going to be a continu continue to be a, a challenge. However, there are some robust results in the Q tomography. At long wavelengths uh, in the uppermost mantle, it is clear that uh, the um, attenuation structure follows uh, the um, elastic structure, is correlated with the elastic structure with um, low velocity zones uh, correlating with high attenuation zones um, at the global scale, at the long wavelengths. And then there are some regional studies, especially around subduction zones, that, um, that have more precise um, kind of um, evidence for, um, for very low Q uh, anomalies uh, in the back arc regions, for example. So maybe I should stop here and <laughs> for now. <laughs> There is another, I mean, if you talk, if you ask me about the upper mantle, there is another uh, topic that I would have liked to uh, say a few words about is uh, it now has to do with continents and with the, uh, with the discovery of a mid lithospheric discontinuity in the stable um, parts of the continents and in the cratons specifically, which uh, was first discovered in long range seismic studies um, by Thibault and Perhuch. Perhuch um, in the late 1990s, uh, they called it the eight degree discontinuity. Uh, and then uh, as the um, receiver function studies uh, became uh, sort of uh, blossomed, uh, it, uh, it was uh, detected uh, um, on all continents. And of course, uh, recently with the um, deployment of the US array uh, network in, in, North, in, uh, in the US, it has been uh, mapped uh, quite uh, in detail. Hey, thanks. That's a very long answer, but I. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. Actually, I want to I want to turn to a, a question that was asked by Min Chen from Michigan State, and she asked you about about whether you can say something whether the the, the, the shape of the plume that you that you see in your tomography does it say something about the thermochemical nature of the plumes, uh, uh, or or are you are you concerned perhaps also about um, how well the the, 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 the ray speed reduction and the geometry of the plume can be resolved by, uh, by long period waveforms? Well, um, okay, so this is a two part question. The first part, uh, yes, the shape of the plumes, if we can recover it uh, accurately, will tell us uh, about their thermochemical nature because if you, cons if you look at models of purely thermal plumes in a model without compositional heterogeneity, they are rather straight. They have thin um, tails and big heads, and they 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 go. Um, they are uh, they have re relatively simple shapes. Whereas if they are thermochemical, as have been, has has been shown already, both in the laboratory by Andavai and, and her colleagues, and by many numerical studies, they uh, can have. Uh, many uh, basically differences in width or differences in diameters as they go up. Um, they have bulges and they have an X uh, all, all along. So 
um, so this is certainly a criterion. Uh, now, whether we can uh, resolve it, uh, it seems we can from uh, you know, any synthetic test that has been done so far, uh, we, we can, but we, um, uh, you know, I don't think we, we yet can be completely sure that we got them nailed down on exactly how wide they are and exactly uh, their exact shape. I think the fact that we see them not, not having some complex shape is, um, is probably going to be robust. But I would, uh, I, I would be hesitant to say that we have pinned them down because there is smearing in the inverse pro inversion process due to the necessary damping. Uh, there is uh, limit, limits in uh, the sampling is not uniform. I mean, there are, there are still quite a few uh, challenges to overcome. And... Um, uh, what can be done to better recover the true seismic signatures of the plumes? Well, I think uh, focusing on region, uh, regional focus, uh, um, kind of zooming in on some plumes that uh, perhaps uh, we can have better coverage of and going to higher frequency for, uh, to, um, to study them, uh, to study them both from the long wavelengths and the short wavelengths together. Should I mean, I believe there's still progress to be made that can be made. So I, I want to turn to a question by, by I, I'm going to combine two questions, one by Karen Fisher and one by Doug Drager. And it's basically, Doug, Doug essentially asks you what is the, what would be the balance or what is the most, what are the contributions of, of new data um, uh, efforts to, to collect new data over the, over the past decades? versus say computational or, or method developments. Um, so that's, that's the question that Doug asks you. And then Karen, I want to combine it with Karen's question that asks you, well, what, what if you have all the money you have in the world, how would you design new arrays to, to improve resolution in the, in the, in the deep mantle? Okay, so um, regarding, uh, well, I'll pull it apart into two questions again. <laughs> But uh, uh, two, two answers. In terms of um, the balance between improvements in observations, the uh, deployment of uh, the efforts in instrumentation development and their deployment across the earth and computational um, improvements, I think they just go hand in hand. They're both necessary and they both have been instrumental in improving uh, our uh, resolution of structure. That's, that is... Um, uh, that there is no doubt about it. The computational advances help us make up a little bit for the lack of, uh, of uh, resolution from the standard seismic waves that have been used uh, in, the cl in, you know, in classical tomography, which, which um, by, by uh, allowing us to use all of the information in the seismograms. However, this is still not quite enough if we cannot um, cover the oceans in particular uh, in more detail and the, um, the oceans, but also continents, of course, and the, uh, the wonderful work that I was, has been made possible by USRA is just a, a testimony to this. Now, uh, my dream, well, uh, my dream <laughs> would be, as I, as I mentioned in my last slide, I would like to see very large aperture arrays in the oceans so that uh, that would be specific um, with, uh, with the goal in mind of looking very deep in the earth and uh, el elucidating more of the very, um, of the deepest mantle, like near the core mantle boundary or the, the last uh, 500 kilometers perhaps, uh, where the structures are clearly um, uh, small scale, there are small scale uh, stru uh, structures, coherent structures, uh, which, um, which necessitate a, a large view uh, that you have to be able to sweep them in as azim large azimuth and uh, in a, a distance range, which may not be sufficient if, you're, if the aperture of your rays is only a thousand kilometers. And I realize that a thousand kilometers is already a huge challenge for um, you know, for ocean bottom deployments. But uh, since you asked me about my dream, that uh, would be it. OK, 
Hey, I want to, um, maybe I can follow up on the question that was asked by James, uh, James Bela, which is about the origin of the magnetic field. Maybe I can ask you, because uh, you, you answered that question directly in the chat, but maybe you can say something more general about how, how, for, how, how mental dynamics is coupled to the dynamics in the core and maybe how, how, um, how heat flow or how heat, um, or how the, yes. the, 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 sorry, the, the, I'm hearing double, I hear myself doubling this headphone, sorry, stumble a little bit, but how, how heat in the earth is, is, uh, is moving uh, over time. Right, so the time scales of convection in the core and in the mantle are quite different because the core is fluid, the core is liquid, the outer core is liquid, and the mantle is solid. So the mantle flows very, very slowly, uh, as evidenced by the motions of the plates up near the surface, centimeters per year. Its uh, motions are likely even slower in the lower mantle. So in fact, the mantle is imposing boundary conditions on the flow in the core, which is uh, more of uh, much, much faster. You know, uh, we're talking about uh, instead of centimeters per year, kilometers per year uh, or tens of kilometers per year. So, so, so effectively the mantle is imposing boundary conditions and in particular thermal boundary conditions uh, in that you have downwelling, cold downwellings on some regions, hot upwellings in other regions, and therefore lateral variations in the, um, boundary conditions for, uh, for heat flow. And uh, it is, uh, uh, I mean, that is of course not the work of, primarily not the work of seismologists, but uh, of geo hydro magneto dynamicists who uh, use these um, uh, boundary conditions, at least at the long wavelengths as provided by the, uh, the well-resolved long wavelength structure from uh, seismic tomography to, um, to basically drive uh, the kind of flow you can observe in the outer core. And in particular, um, this, these flows also impose uh, boundary conditions, um, thermal boundary conditions at the top of the inner core, which may also be important about to understand um, the structure and anisotropy of the inner core that I didn't have much time to talk about. So I don't know if this answers the question sufficiently. I don't know. For you, this. So, so Thorne Lay has a question about uh, about uh, the, topog the topography of the core mantle boundary. Um, what is your take on that? How has it improved over the past uh, forty years? And was it what what will it take to uh, to truly resolve uh, core mantle boundary topography? Okay, so that that is a very difficult question. I did not talk about the core mantle boundary topography. It is, in my view, still very controversial uh, because there are many trade offs between resolving the core mantle boundary topography and the structure, the volumetric structure in the D double prime region. Um, to truly resolve it, uh, it is necessary to come, and also the coverage that is uh, um, available from, from uh, the different types of body waves that can sample this region uh, is, is limited. So uh, improving, so resolution of global uh, CMB topography will uh, definitely require more arrays in much more extended regions. For example, I mean, I will talk from my own experience. So one probably actually knows more about this than I do, but uh, just using US array to study the command to boundary topography is you actually, because of the distribution of sources and stations, you're limited to very small patches on the core mantle boundary to really look at it in detail. So it's still quite frustrating. Um, but, but there is this inherent um, uh, trade-off and because the heterogeneity in D double prime is very strong, this is a, this is a challenge. Yeah, what, what it might also be a challenge is, is density at the core mantle boundary. Maybe you can say something about that because you mentioned it in your talk that yes. there has there have been some results, but what, what is the prospect for, 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 for resolving density variations in the deep mantle? Well, um, I think uh, the, the only data, at, well, at long wavelengths, the only data that are really sensitive to, um, to density are normal mode data. And recently, um, 
what has been has been proposed also to use tide data to look at the deep mantle density. Um, there, there, there are um, possible uh, advances still ahead of us in the way we treat uh, normal mode data, which uh, typically have been uh, treated with some uh, relatively simple approximations. Uh, so there are uh, advances to be made in that direction. Um, I think also with the improved uh, arrays, uh, well kind of positioned to, to look at specific regions in the lowermost mantle. And I'm actually thinking specifically about the roots of mantle plumes. Uh, we may be able to use a combination of different uh, body wave phases to look in detail and maybe find even reflected waves on the sides of, um, of these plumes or the sides of the LLSVPs uh, that uh, could uh, also provide some more information about density contrast uh, in the deep mantle. It is a challenging topic, yes. Right. Um, I do encourage people to answer, to ask questions in the chat because I'm feeling I'm, I'm asking them myself too many. Um, Ron, could I jump in? Um, yes, please, John. Ask a slightly different question. Um, Barbara, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more. Uh, you've talked a lot about the benefits of, of more instrumentation and OBS arrays and so on, but I'm wondering if you could talk about things we've seen developed in the last few years, like ambient noise correlation and so on. and what the prospect is for mining very, very large seismic data sets that have been collected over the last few years. Okay, I'll answer that and then I'll, I'll address Frederick Simmons' uh, question about mermaids too. So, um, yes, so noise uh, tomography, of course, uh, has developed. Uh, I did not talk about it because most of the stable results still concern the upper mantle and I didn't talk about the upper, upper mantle, so upper, uppermost mantle and crust. Uh, these uh, have basically revolutionized studies of the Earth's crust in continents uh, because you don't need earthquakes and you can use uh, basically couple, um, couples of stations, right, um, pairs of stations to, um, so if you have dense arrays, uh, you can um, uh, use them to, to study the structure in the absence of um, of any um, uh, earthquakes. Uh, there, there have been developments on trying to extract body wave information from uh, these um, kind of data. Uh, I think there's still, um, you know, emerging basically uh, methodologies, uh, whether or not uh, you can really focus on a particular region and, and get additional information on that uh, region in the deep mantle uh, still um, needs to be uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, basically um, elaborated or, or uh, 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 determined. It, it is a promising method, but, uh, but still uh, really in development. Uh, there is also the limitation that if you want to study the structure beneath the oceans, even in the upper, upper mantle, you need, um, arrays of stations, um, more, more data from the oceans. And so this brings me to Fred Simmons' uh, question, which uh, I'm happy he asked. Yes, of course, I didn't uh, talk about uh, mermaids, which are the mobile uh, drifting instrumentation that uh, is being uh, deployed uh, by him and colleagues and uh, uh, Nuhus Nolet and others um, in, uh, in the oceans. And that looks promising. Um, the first um, goal is, is to pick up the, um, the P waves, which they have demonstrated is feasible. Uh, and, and now they're looking into uh, trying to see other, uh, um, you know, pick up other first arriving phases. And it's going to be probably a sort of a trade-off between, you know, how many of those you can deploy uh, to really cover the oceans. Uh, if you were able to cover the oceans entirely with uh, mermaids, uh, only the P waves would be sufficient to um, determine the whole Earth structure as mathematic mathematicians tell us, 
okay but uh, but the reality is is a little bit more complicated uh, however yes this is um, uh, this is certainly a uh, an important uh, modern contribution that uh, that uh, that is uh, you know is bound in the next few years to to provide uh, new information on at least on some in some regions of the deep mantle Okay, I think we are to the last question for this for the session. That that's uh, something that uh, I've been thinking about. It's something about how you how 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 seismology and geodynamics are 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 are, are interdisciplinary uh, disciplines. How they uh, how 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 do geodynamicists um, pose questions to seismologists? How do seismologists pose questions to to geodynamicists? And how are the how are the two interacting and and, and moving the fields? Uh, the fields forward. So, what is your what is your idea of of of, of new outstanding research questions for the coming years? To, uh, for the coming years. Well, I would throw in in addition to geodynamics, I would actually throw in mineral physics, Fair enough. and and even geochemistry. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, geochemistry, and and just say that uh, uh, that in fact uh, the challenge right now for us is that uh, uh, none of these fields can do it all uh, by themselves. Uh, there are limitations in seismology. There are limitations on what geodynamics models can can tell us. They um, uh, they rely on on um, on some specific hypothesis testing specific hypotheses that uh, can be provided by seismology. But seismology only gives you a snapshot of the present uh, the present day um, structure. So uh, you really have to combine all of this and uh, also knowledge about uh, the mineral composition of the of the mantle of of the earth actually uh, all the way to the to the core uh, to um, to 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 kind of get a, a much more um, elaborated and uh, get, gain more understanding on how our planet works. And uh, I think the challenge here is uh, is. Uh, is the mutual understanding of these um, of these different disciplines, uh, which have uh, uh, people are, are generally focused on their own discipline. There is enough uh, work to be done to learn everything that you need to learn to be able to be, a, you know, a, a proficient seismologist. And there are language uh, differences. There are um, uh, also differences in um, in estimating what is really a, a result that is uh, um, robust in the other discipline, what, what are the limitations. Um, and uh, so moving forward, uh, it's, it's really important to, to try and, and uh, cross-educate ourselves in, in these different disciplines. Uh, now, more specifically, uh, what I see um, as a future challenge, or what would be really nice to see happen, is a geodynamic model uh, modeling that, uh, of course, uh, relies on some constraints brought by seismology, but that would uh, be able to um, to include really much more complex rheologies um, in, in in the mantle than it, than is currently possible, so that you could have the you know a complete feedback between the geodynamics, the strain field as it evolves with time, uh, turn this into uh, mineral physics, um, you know, the elastic, elastic parameters and slip systems and how these evolve and then, and then turn that into seismic, um, uh, seismic parameters and confront that with, with uh, seismology. This is, this is being done, but it's still being done at, uh, at a very um, simplistic, in a very simplistic way, and uh, hopefully, uh, we can make progress in, in improving this type of feedback between um, the different disciplines. Thank you very much, Barbara, for some fascinating answers to some really uh, thought-provoking questions. And thank you, Jerome, for uh, fielding those questions and, and uh, combining some of them together for Barbara. Look, this has been a great start to the conference. Um, it's really excellent to see the, the comments coming in on the uh, chat. And I hope you'll continue to provide comments during the course of the meeting, which Barbara may be able to answer at a later date. Um, uh, just this morning, I've seen two mentions of dreams, and I've seen lots of mentions of mermaids, so we're off to a good start. 
And if we can just keep that sort of level of enthusiasm going, I think we'll have a fantastic conference. So wherever you are and whatever the time zone, um, could you please join me in thanking Barbara for a really thought provoking and stimulating opening speech. And also thank you, Jerome. And I'll uh, see you all around. I must remind you that there's the um, uh, joiner lecture later today and then the joiner reception. So I hope you'll all be able to join us for both those events and uh, then we'll see you in the sessions throughout the course of the week. Thank you all very much. Have a fantastic conference.